Okay. Okay, so um, so for today, you guys, uh, today, so Tuesday was a bit about uh, some logistics, onboarding, kind of overview type stuff. Today is really more about a conceptual overview of what we're going to be, the kinds of things we're going to be talking about this semester. After after today, we'll be getting into much more technical details in, in, in the science and stuff. But today is really about um, trying to make sure we have the right framework that will that will bring to the, the thinking about the coast. Um, and I should also say, um, just so everybody knows, uh, our, my default thing, uh, our default thing will be to rec usually record our lectures and then I post them on our YouTube site. So, so um, if you uh, miss something and you guys wanted to go back and look at a slide or something like that, they'll be there. Um, if you were sick and not in class, you can do it and you can um, review at your leisure, right? So, so sometimes you might go a little bit faster, um, uh, just sort of to hit some goals. But realize if, if you're someone that needs a little bit slower pace or, or want like to review stuff more, you always have the stuff on demand. So, um, so uh, again, it might take a day or so to get posted, but it'll, it will, um, generally speaking, be there. Um, and the same goes for today. Okay, so um, what I first want to talk about is uh, this, uh, this idea of um, uh, Cimarron or Sarah. So sometimes we have these issues when we talk about management of resources where um, something is either always awesome or idealized or it's always bad or dark or scary. And so um, the reality is um, there are awesome, great, super cool things. There are dangerous, uncertain, scary, um, foreboding elements of uh, these resource challenges. But most stuff are kind of in between. And in fact, most things are often can be both at the same time. There can be parts that are really cool and parts that are really um, scary or uncertain. And that's uh, what we will probably find as we go and investigate most of these issues over the course of the semester. And so um, we'll start with just about a, a, a tour here to cruise around and talk about some of the different types of issues we're going to see. Um, and, and speak to over the course of the semester. So I played, you, I played you our Golden Dream song. So here's one that's right in the news right now. So I said, let me ask you a question. And he said, nobody ever asked this question. And it was because of MIT, my relationship to MIT. Very smart, he goes, I say, what would happen if the boat sank from its weight and you're in the boat and you have this tremendously powerful battery and the battery's now underwater and there's a shark that's approximately 10 yards over there. By the way, a lot of shark attacks lately, you know what I'm saying? A lot of shark. I watched some guys justifying it today. Well, they weren't really that angry. They bit off the young lady's leg because of the fact that they were they were not hungry, but they misunderstood what who she was. These people are quick. He said, there's no problem with sharks. They just didn't really understand a young woman swimming, you know, really got decimated and other people do a lot of shark attacks. They said, so there's a shark 10 yards away from the boat, 10 yards or here. Do I get electrocuted if the boat is sinking, water goes over the battery, the boat is sinking? Do I stay on top of the boat and get electrocuted? <laughs> Or do I jump over by the shark and not get electrocuted? Because I will tell you, he didn't know the answer. He said, you know, nobody's ever asked me that question. <laughs> I said, I think it's a good question. I think there's a lot of electric current coming through that water. But you know what I do if there was a shark or you get electrocuted? I'll take electrocution every single time. I'm not getting near the shark. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first I should say that we're having our first boating safety class <laughs> this semester, uh, but um, uh, I will say that, uh, wow, right, wow, uh, so just about everything that was said there is factually incorrect and, and not real, um, but uh, it speaks to a lot of the challenges that we have in the coastal zone, right, so, so um, that was I mean, that was a stream of consciousness that was supposed to be about a, a technical topic, and but 
let's leave all that stuff aside. But the idea of, um, hey, we're having new technologies in this, in this space, in the, in the, on the land near the ocean, the ocean near the land. Sometimes those are challenging, but the reality is we actually really understand almost all these technologies. So the notion that a, a, a battery on the water would electrocute you is um, uh, ignorant is one word I could use for that. Um, and, uh, it is true that sharks have a really fantastic sense of um, a, a, a ability to detect electrical signals. These things called loops of Lorenzini in their, in their, no, by their nose. Um, and, uh, and they're really, really great at detecting electrical signals. Um, they do not attack boats though, uh, uh, that kind of thing. So, so um, again, what we'll see sometimes because the coast is so familiar, because the coast is such a ubiquitous part of our culture, our society, and indeed our global culture, people think even if they don't live at the coast, even if they haven't resided, you know, their life here or whatever, um, there's a general sense of familiarity with it. And so sometimes, so that, that, and what, that's great, right? Everybody's, everybody feels some kind of at least vague connection to the coast, at least in movies or TV or pop culture or something. But it sometimes also makes people think they, they know more than they do, right? And that I think was the case in, in, that, in that situation. Okay, so this is, this is a couple hours ago right now. So this is, um, these are global uh, wind patterns. And what we're looking at right now is we're looking out at um, uh, the, the Central Pacific. And there's these three storms, uh, either storms or remnants of storms that are right uh, near Hawaii. And, and we can see them because they're the intense green um, uh, spinning of, of, uh, of air. The physics, the, the physical goings on of these areas are really important. So we'll spend some time uh, with my crash course on, on oceanography. So um, uh, this, isn't, this is not a, an oceanography class, but there are certain things we need to make sure that we understand that have direct management implications for where fishes are, what, why the shipping channels are where they are, uh, storms, that kind of stuff. And so this is today, this is a year ago, um, the, the one that I used last year's uh, you know, intro lecture. In this case, this was, um, it had just become a tropical storm when I recorded this video, but this guy right here spinning off of the Carolina coast, um, that was a former hurricane, uh, Idalia, and it, uh, it, it wrecked havoc um, in the, particularly on the, um, northwestern coast of Florida is it, is it blew past, right? So, so natural disasters are a key part of coastal management and they, they have all kinds of, they imply all kinds of um, uh, challenges and they manifest all kinds of challenges and they require uh, increasingly more sophisticated responses to, to plan for, to, to have evacuation routes, to have restoration stuff after the fact. And in general, we're not doing a great job um, of that uh, uh, overall, I, I would argue. Um, and, and then, you know, in 2020, we started this class and there were these hurricanes. So, so in 2017, we had Hurricane Harvey. Um, and then importantly to mention today, which is why I'm wearing all my NOLA stuff, um, today is the 19th anniversary of the um, uh, landfall of Hurricane Katrina in, in the U.S. mainland in Louisiana. And so um, this was, this was, I had just come here, I just started as being a professor here and was, this, this class was actually my very first class I taught here. And um, they had all these plans and then uh, it's very hard for, for you guys to really appreciate this because, you know, it was so long ago, but um, it, it, I mean, maybe something like um, the um, January 6th, the sort of attacking the Capitol or something of that nature, maybe the evacuation of Afghanistan. It's really, really hard to explain how crazy this um, day and the subsequent days were. There was a major US city that was destroyed basically, and our government wasn't doing much to help. Um, there, there was help and, and, and we, it was not that we weren't, weren't doing anything, but this was a major, major city. And we had our fellow citizens inside 
areas which were not official evacuation centers because there were no official evacuation centers because they decided to decertify in the nine months before the, the hurricane hit, decertify those places. So you had folks that were without water for three days in a major American city. And you have your federal rep elected representatives and, and people staffing uh, federal agencies not knowing that and reporters on national television or national radio or, or national news reporters saying, how come these folks are dying and nobody's bringing them anything? They're like, what are you talking about? Like, well, in the Superdome or in the convention center. And they're like, you're telling me that, you know, this is again, um, right in the wake of 9-11. And again, you guys are probably too young, but 9-11 caused this huge reorganization of the government. Patriot Act, all these things. Um, and the argument was, we need to protect you. We need to, the most important thing there is, is to protect the American people. So these other things about civil liberties, these other things about laws, these other things about collaborating with people in certain ways, that's secondary to making sure we're safe. That was the bargain that was offered to the US public. This coastal disaster came along and it was like, hold on a second, you can't even save an old grandma in a in a big city like what the heck's going on so it was really really impactful to us so what we did what what i did at our school is i just threw out all my lectures and we just turned on the news and we just started talking through the different coastal management issues it was it was a live stream of chaos it was it was it was really really crazy um it looked like beirut or or lebanon or some war-torn you know overseas country um and so uh we pivoted and long story short, we started, I started taking you guys there and, and we've been going, um, you know, since uh, uh, taking classes in the spring. So if you guys are interested, you should talk to me about uh, uh, doing this experience. And, and um, we've also recently started going to Lahaina in the same, in the same spirit of, of helping, um, helping folks there. So um, while I could spend hours and hours and hours and hours talking about what happened with Hurricane Katrina, I'll just play you one little video to give you a little bit of the sense of stuff. Now, this is not, this is not um, the city of New Orleans, which has a whole bunch of stories we could talk about. This is right at the spot where the hurricane made landfall. This is in a place called Buras. This is in the boot tip. The southern, the southern uh, part of Louisiana is about an hour drive south of New Orleans. Um, and and uh, so this is uh, some video, and I'll just play this, and you guys can get a sense of what the, what what this part of the coastal zone looks like in this part of the country. Uh, we're here in Buras, Louisiana, uh, near the boot tip of the mouth of the Mississippi River in southeastern Louisiana in Plaquemines Parish. Um, we can talk about resilience in terms of coastal systems, resilience to uh hurricanes and coastal disasters in a couple different ways this landscape used to be more like this it used to be more wooded swamp etc this is even pretty disturbed over here but um for you know several centuries now people have been coming in and, and um changing this landscape and so when we talk about resiliency we can talk about the infrastructure but we also need to talk about the people um aspect of, of stuff here and so a key aspect of that resilience is can people uh, live a healthy, um, a rewarding life in these systems. And part of that is making sure people have access to healthy, affordable food. And so we're right here installing um, this year's food garden um, in the, on the property of uh, Carol Arsenault, the Arsenault family, and their, their uh, kids and, and now happily uh, first grandkid. Um, and so this garden is a huge resource. So fantastic um, soils down here are part of the natural uh, uh, abundance of this part of our country. This part of our country, um, and it's fantastic for growing. It's hard to grow because it is so silty. We have to make sure we have some some amendments and things coming. But if you do that, it's a fantastic place to grow. As we go up and look um, at this overall landscape, what we see is this system is highly perturbed, right? So the resilience is made that much harder. Be it food resilience. Um, um, infrastructure. So that's the Mississippi whatever. River. As we look over um, eastward, we will see uh, a levee. That levee is the Mississippi River, and then just beyond, you'll see the Mississippi River. Uh, could be some ships in there. Um, it could be blank, but that is a heavily trafficked area. Even if there isn't a ship in there, that this exact instant. Um, so we have the levee on that side, and then if we turn and look uh, to the west, we see again. We'll, we'll see the, the 23 freeway. 
So that's all the land that's there, that little teeny strip, right? That's all the land. We see a, um, uh, another levy. That levy is protecting this landscape from encroachment by the Gulf of Mexico, from the ocean. So we have this little teeny, literally sliver of land. Building resilience is hard when we limit our options. And so when we have uh, not a lot of food opportunities, not a lot of um, um, stores where people can get a healthy, affordable, um, nutritious food, that's hard. When we constrain the landscape so that we don't have the um, natural ecosystem services that would replenish the soil and, and act to, to augment the critters and, and, and everything in this whole ecosystem, as they have evolved, uh, and co-evolved over the, the millennia here, and then makes it that much harder. As we've abandoned and not supported the, the human communities here, it's that much harder again to build a resilient, vibrant, um, healthy um, coastal system. So um, folks here in Lower Plaquemines are, are still here, still working, still, still a fighting a good fight, but it is getting harder to be resilient. This story here is a story that plays out all across coastal zones across the planet. Um, and it's something we all need to be concerned with, not just the folks that immediately live here or live next to them. This is um, a true cultural concern in terms of resilient, healthy communities living in and around coastal systems, in and around areas exposed to increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters and other stressors. Story. Okay. Um, I can play another one here, and this is, I don't have to play all these videos, but um, so this is, this is an example of our own sort of crazy disasters, right, in our own immediate coastal zone. In this case, this is the, the burning of the palm trees in the, in the, the, the coastal, immediate coastal strand um, during the Thomas fire, right? So this is around the Rincon coast and everything. So we haven't historically thought of wildfires on our beaches or wildfires in our coastal estuaries. Um, that's happening too. So, so this management, we talk about these things, we might, we'll, we'll um, primarily focus on California because of where we are in this class, but, um, but, you know, we'll look at examples from other places and things like that, but realize that um, while some of the, the specifics might be a California example or a Louisiana example or a, a European example or whatever, um, uh, really the, the, the overarching themes, the overarching ideas, the overarching concerns really apply to communities all over the place and, and, and settings all over the place. Um, and, and again, wildfire, which we typically think of as an inland problem, is now uh, everything problem. And so this, in this case, this is um, air quality during the pandemic when we had some of those crazy, crazy fires. It's all over the place. And we're seeing um, this, these systems, these disasters which we might historically have thought, oh, that's an ocean phenomenon, or that's a, a land-based phenomenon. Increasingly, they're, they're getting at the scale and magnitude that um, the oceanic things are coming way onto land. The on-land things are going way out in the middle of the ocean. And so, so um, in the case of wildfire in particular, we see the signal in our oceans now um, in terms of plankton and, and things of that nature. Um, another uh, example is uh, Lahaina. And so, at the start of um, uh, last year's class, the Maui, West Maui wildfires had just happened. So this is um, a picture uh, from when we were there in 2020, um, doing some of our long-term whale uh, monitoring. In which, and so we're um, on the water, looking back to land. And what this big giant thing is, is a solar uh, farm, a solar power uh, generation station, essentially. Um, but what we're looking at right there, oh, I think I talked about it in a bit. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll play one more video and we'll just talk about it. But this is, this should be much more forested. This area around this, around this um, solar installation, it looks like a, a grassland and it is a grassland. It should not be a grassland. It wants to, it, it, it um, if left to its own devices, um, it would be much more woody, much more densely vegetated and much more uh, tall structured vegetation. Um, so I, I'll talk about it in a second, but, but really what we're seeing here is the legacy of this. So this is sugarcane. This is industrial agriculture that started going in in the 1800s, primarily from American, um, um, essentially colonists. Um, 
and uh, and that radically started to change the plants, also started to change the hydrology, how water moved around in this part of um, the coastal zone in Hawaii. Um, and, then, and then those plants closed. Those plants are, 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 are for the most part, those sugarcane pineapple plantations shut down. Um, starting in the 80s, really 90s, they picked up. And so essentially they've been, for the most part, abandoned now. So we had intense agriculture and then we left them. And so what's come in is this massive sea of weeds, just like our California hillsides are primarily Eurasian grasses now, as opposed to the native um, vegetation that used to be here. Um, and that was uh, one, of the, you know, one of the key drivers as to why we had the wildfire and we had all the destruction, et cetera, um, uh, last year. This is the harbor. So this harbor should be full of boats. Another thing we'll talk about over the course of this semester is ecotourism, um, 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 how, we, how people come and visit and recreate in the coastal zone. So this is this little teeny tiny harbor. It should be full of boats. So when it was full of boats, I think I counted like typically like about 100 boats. So it's not, it's not a massive, massive harbor. It's not the scale of Marina del Rey or something, but it's, it's you know, pretty big. And this is right after the fire and you see massive devastation. So not just of the terrestrial community, but also of the, the ways people could get to the ocean and the way people could tra traverse the ocean was, was heavily um, uh, impacted by this event. Um, more views of that stuff. Um, this is a video that explains that, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll play a different one in a second. So, um, so one of the themes that that video talks about is, in addition to other stuff, our policies. So in the wake of, our, of a disaster or in the wake of a, a change administration or something of that nature, the policies that we have in the coastal zone play out um, uh, quite a lot. And sometimes those are explicit governmental policies. Sometimes those are cultural traditions, and sometimes they're, they're just uh, a lack of policy, which is the policy, which is bad. And so one of the big concerns here, as with most of these disasters in the wake of the coastal zone, is um, folks marginalized, and then folks um, that don't have a lot of resources, and then something like this happens, they don't have the resources maybe to immediately respond and start to rebuild or start to recover. And there's often people there that are like, hey, I'll give you some money. Can I just have your land or can I just have your property or can I just have your boat or can I just have your whatever it is and I'll give you some money and um, you know that's that that's a really difficult decision because a lot of times people don't have enough food to eat they don't have shelter they don't have this or that and, and so we saw that play out um, in Maui as well. Um, there's all kinds of culture, though, while we won't focus on our culture, a lot of this culture will come through in our policies so i'll play just a little bit of this video this is from several years ago, this is on the Big Island, but this just shows an example of the kind of, of um, a deep culture we can see. We're going to say who you are and where we are. Okay, um, hi, I'm Jesse. Um, we're at Alpana, Uncle Robert's Alpha Bar. This is my jury table, and I'm about to tell you about myself. Good. Okay, these are the four different types of opinis right. that okay. we have in Hawaii. Opinis are listed. Right. The Makai Ali is above the waterline. The Alpha the Alina Lina is at the waterline, and the Kuene is below the waterline. So below, uh, above, 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 and at. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Okay. So the Kuene is the largest river in the world, probably in Hawaii. Males are black, females are not. And how old? So how old is this? I don't know. Actually, keyhole limits are bigger, but that's okay. We'll, we'll leave that. We'll leave that to the side. Yeah, 30, 40, 50. Yeah, this is an old brother. Okay. This is like maybe about six years or something. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, it takes, it takes years to grow. You know, is it a male? Is it a female? Male, female, male, female. Okay. How do you collect them? How do you harvest them? Uh, so the OB pickers harvest them. Uh, my name's the thing doing it. I used to do it when I was young. <laughs> Okay, so, so then she, she goes and talks about all this cool stuff. Um, uh, so uh, long histories, in many cases, with our coastlines, right? So native peoples, uh, uh, non-native peoples, a, a lot of these traditions are really, really important. And so they are fundamental to people's lives, both their enjoyment of their life, their livelihoods, all that kind of stuff. And I think sometimes we have, we, um, I want to make sure I don't give the impression 
that people like Professor Spees and me, we do all the stuff and all this highly trained stuff, which is great. The stuff we're trained you guys to do, highly trained, that's great. There are many ways of knowing though. There are many ways of understanding our, our place in the world and how we interact with this stuff. And um, just like other areas of the planet, the coastal zone is rife with all kinds of great ways of, of engaging. Um, I'll play this other, this will be pretty loud, so I'll make sure uh, uh, I'll turn it down a little bit. But so this is um, the day after our students left when we were doing our service project, um, and some of you were there with us, it was just great, uh, this uh, last trip, um, we had a unity gathering, um, which is only the second time in history that all four ocean-going canoes in Hawaii came together. Um, uh, and uh, we can talk more about that if you want, but, but essentially this is a ritualized greeting. And so these different folks coming from around the world and the South Pacific and other places would come and there's a very ritualized thing here that has to do with, with um, understanding the coast and bringing things from other coastlines to this coastline as a sign of respect and, 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 and um, uh, you know, honor and that kind of stuff. And so this is, this went on for hours and hours and hours, but this is just um, uh, this chant that everybody is singing. So this is, so these guys that you see here, so this guy here is the gentleman that organized that. He teaches uh, Navy SEALs how to survive uh, down in, in, in uh, SEAL training in San Diego. And, and he was one of the first navigators. All these guys down front were some of the, the original um, people that, refit, that rediscovered the coastal culture of Polynesian sailing. So in 1976, uh, the Hawaiian people, be, we now trace back, we now call the Hawaiian Renaissance, where this culture was sort of suppressed and this culture was kept down and all that kind of stuff. Um, they began reasserting it, their own culture and part of that was ocean traveling. And these folks had not built an ocean going canoe in 600 years, but they just said, maybe we should do that. So in 1976, they completed that. And the folks you see here in the front row <clears throat> are essentially the elders the ones that first got on the boats and crashed into the reef and didn't know how to do it and like basically trial by learning and then eventually traveled to Tahiti and learned some of the traditional celestial navigation from some of those folks. So this is just a little, just play a minute or so of this song. So it's a call and response. Okay, so um, so strong culture, right? So so these so sometimes we also have the opinion of of some of these, um, like in Louisiana, some of these um, coastal communities are are marginalized because of housing prices and because of um, rising sea levels and all that kind of stuff. And that absolutely is the case in some places, but only some places, right? So this culture is strong, right? So so these coastal people know who the hell they are, know what they want, know how to be responsible stewards of the resources and stuff and they're not um they're not quiet i'll just say that right and so um so there's all kinds of wonderful ways of knowing and there's all kinds of cultures and ways of interacting um want to make sure that even though again we're mostly going to talk about the technical side of stuff here stuff that um, dr spees and, and i 
work on. Um, but uh, there are all kinds of great energy and great solutions that are coming to a lot of these management challenges that we'll see from various uh, ones. So I'll play one more and then that'll be my last uh, video. So this is, this is just a quick summary of all those things I told you. And I, but I think it encapsulates a lot of this issue. Uh, is, a question so far, is this making sense, you guys? Anything, any questions so far? Okay, so this is the last long one we'll play and then we'll get into talking about stuff in California. Theoretically, okay. So we're here in, on the west side of Maui, um, the Lahaina district, we're a little bit north of the town of Lahaina. And this is a great example of the kind of things that we tend to do to our coastal zone. In the case of Hawaii, this starts, uh, the, the Western Polynesian interactions really start in, in uh, earnest in 1778 when Captain Cook first lands in what he calls the Sandwich Islands and starts this uh, interaction between the West and Polynesia. Uh, they, uh, that initiates a trade for metal and guns and, and, and Western technology for things like, um, in particular, sandalwood. So sandalwood becomes this big thing. So at the time, if we look up to the hillsides here on the craters in, in Maui, we have Koa, Apiu, and sandalwood are the three major vegetation, uh, woody vegetation types that, that are dominating the slopes. And sandalwood is a is a type of wood that really is very uh, smelly, very fragrant, and maintains its fragrancy for a long time. It's a very desirous wood. So people wanted this sandalwood. Um, there's, there's several species, but so basically all kinds of sandalwood out here. So we start trading that primarily with Asia, and then through that Asian trade, um, in that Asian trade, uh, uh, the whalers, the Yankee traders, the people out of New Bedford and, and that part of New England, that had depleted all of the whales in, in our part of, in the eastern part of the U.S. and by that point, early 1800s, had depleted all the whales in most of the Atlantic, figure out how to go around the Cape of Good Hope, they figure out how to go into the Pacific consistently, safely, they start doing that. And they come to the South Pacific and they hear tales of these massive whales in Japan that they hear because of the sandalwood trade, because of the Hawaiian sandalwood trade. And so then they start attacking whales. And initially, they're going after sperm whales, bowhead whales, all these uh, 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 oil rich whales, humpback whales, they don't care about. Humpbacks are lame, they don't produce much oil. When you tend to harpoon a uh, humpback, they tend to sink. And go down, so humpbacks weren't particularly interesting. So they got about a hundred year reprieve compared to other whales. But meanwhile, this whole time, starting in the early eight, mid 1800s, lots of foreigners are coming here. Lots of pirates, lots of traders, lots of whalers. And so this whole area is a, a huge deal, right? It's a huge um, international mixing pot with different cultures, different different uh, 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 issues, different priorities, etc. And it's huge. The visionaries come in right behind them and they say, they say, oh my God, this is evil, this is bad, prostitutes, alcohol, all this bad stuff. They try to stomp, you know, stomp it down, doesn't really work. So Lahaina, the, the, the modern version of Lahaina that we know that was used to be the royal, royal retreat becomes this epicenter of international commerce. Lots of books, lots of teachings, lots of art, all that kind of stuff. And that goes crazy. All throughout the early 1800s. Even though there's humpback whales, which you might be able to see some off behind me here. So humpback whales are very, very common here um, uh, as they, as they uh, give birth, etc. in the winter to spring. People didn't harpoon them, even though the whalers were coming on in. Once they deplete their stocks in the Antarctica and other places, and they're desperate for whales, then they start to, to attack these humpback whales here in the channel. Um, because so many whalers came here, it drew, it drew this area to the attention of the Americans, and the Americans came and basically took over this, you know, uh, 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 installed themselves uh, through a series of uh, horrible activities and kicked out the Hawaiian government and put in a uh, a puppet regime that quickly became an American regime. 
and they started doing all kinds of agriculture. So if we look over here, we can't see it because we have hotels in the way, but on these the hill slopes over here used to be all breadfruit, taro, um, um, uh, uh, that type of stuff. A well, very, very wet area here in Maui. And so that gets converted into um, industrial, what we would now call industrial agriculture, pineapples, especially sugar. So all the sugar plantation is going on, and that goes for quite a long time. Um, that's going on, usurping all the local water rights and all that kind of stuff. And then World War II, World War II happens at the end of World War II. Now, the next people that figure this out in, in the wake of hearing about these other people that have been here are the development people. And so they start coming in and start putting in hotels. And so sailors that are here in World War II are stationed in, in uh, Pearl Harbor, places like that, say, like, oh my gosh, it's awesome to be here on the beach. In sunny, in sunny Hawaii, I like this place, so they want to stay here. People realize this is maybe a vacation place. And so we start to see the first modern, sort of what we now call the modern hotel thing start going in the wake of World War II, really get going in the 60s and 70s. And so eventually we get what we have here. So the native peoples that have something similar to us in California, which is everybody has access to the coast, to the beach, to the water, here though, um, and it's just the same in Hawaii. So those are displaced here, people from the fire. Um, these areas are usurped, right? So this property is taken over by Americans and by wealthy folks. And then in the wake of World War II, it's taken over by the hotel developers, etc. And so now we have, in this whole stretch, we're looking here, we're now north of the town of Lahaina. Pretty much, and this is uh, 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 about a two mile, three mile stretch of hotels. It's Hotel One, it's a Hotel Two, it's a Hotel Three, it's a Hotel Four, etc. And while there is public access points here, we just walked down a, down a public access point. It's um, it's mostly tourists here, right? It's mostly tourists. This is this is not a beach for Hawaiians per se. Even though we have a, a Hawaiian flag right here in protest, we have a Hawaiian flag, Hawaiian state flag. It's flown upside down in protest of current practices here. Um, but even though we have this flag here, this is this is really not optimized for local Hawaiian use. This is optimized for foreign or tourist uh, use. And this whole economy has now been built and wrapped around tourism. So this beach, this system, is what everybody wants to come hang out on. People want to come here from Wisconsin, they want to come here from Europe, they want to come here from wherever, hang on this wonderful beach, beautiful palm trees, go snorkel, go see the warm water, all that kind of stuff, which is not a bad thing. But when you have miles and miles and miles of this that the native folks can't use, um, maybe that's not a good thing, right? Maybe, maybe we've given too much over to the uh, developers. Okay, you guys get the idea. Okay, um, I'll skip this one since we're not talking about that. So, um, so all those themes, that's sort of our class in a nutshell, right? So that is um, uh, uh, political decisions, that is displacement issues, that is changing the ecology of the coastal zone, that's economic things developing and then adding new pressures, all that kind of stuff we'll see over and over again in different settings. Um, uh, one of the, th we won't get to this today, this will be next week, but one of our first lab activities will be looking at um, an example of ecotourism from Hawaii, in this case from the Big Island, not Maui. Um, but in this case, uh, this is um, a relatively sustainable type of, of ecotourism um, uh, where people get to go uh, check out these, these really cool giant fish, these manta rays, um, and it's become a huge thing. This is when I, I, one year I took you guys, I took our coastal management class to Hawaii um, and, and we saw this stuff. Um, another key theme that we're going to see, um, especially as, as sort of the latter half of the semester, is in particular our food provisioning in and around the coastal zone. And so this is a shot from a couple of years ago, just off of PCH. So I just pull off the road and record this. It's November of 2018. And we see here, looking just off the coast of Malibu, we're just about at your, the bottom of Yerba Buena Road here on the edge of PCH. We see this very large squid fleet. So, our most, uh, in terms of the number of individuals harvested, in terms of the gross poundage of seafood landed in California, our squid fishery is number one or, or always close to number one for the past many years. So, these guys are going out in these boats at these very large lights. 
what we're seeing right here at sunset. We've activated these lights. The squid are phototactic, so they're going to swim towards the light. So the squid are attracted to these lights. So the, these, these lights are essentially mimicking the moon. Uh, and uh, these guys are going to deploy hooks, and they're going to capture the squid. In this case, mostly we're talking raw and grow market squid. Okay, we don't we don't need to talk more about that, but but, but you guys get the idea. So um, so has anybody taken uh, Dr. Steele's fisheries class last semester? When, so you guys heard Professor Gallopo talk about the squid stuff? Yeah, so cool. So um, so a really fantastic fishery, a very sustainable fishery, the squid fishery. Um, but as with all of our resources, needs to be well managed, and uh, and there's maybe some improvements we can do to make it even more uh, sustainable over the long term. Um, but this is pretty crazy. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, most of us wouldn't suspect that we have like, you know, one of the largest fisheries in our state just off of our coast, because it mostly happens at night, right? It mostly happens when we don't, we're not seeing it. And, and while there's sometimes like this tight in near our coastline, a lot of times they're off on the Channel Islands, Catalina, that kind of place. So they're not, they're not quite right in front of us. Um, uh, and also a fantastic example of uh, lameness of our policy in terms of energy. So back, in, so 50 years ago, all of this squid that was captured here in, Cal, in California waters was processed here. It was, you know, we, we brought it on shore, you know, cleaned it up, whatever, and then sent it to restaurants or whoever's buying it. Almost none of that is, <clears throat> is, um, is, is handled in California anymore. So if we wanna go down to the docks in Ventura or something or San Pedro, we could, or Santa Barbara, we could probably buy some, you know, fresh squid, which is great, right? Okay, cool, buy that. But the, just about all the rest of it, even though we go to Albertsons or go to Vaughn's or whatever, and we buy markets, we buy, you know, market squid, and it says California, We're like, ah, cool. What happened with that squid is it got cop captured by these boats, brought back to shore, flash frozen, whole, flash frozen as, as a solid individual, put on a long haul freighter, shipped to China, thawed, uh, gutted, cleaned out, and then either, you know, just washed, or if it's gonna be cooked, you know, like, like steam cooked kind of thing, repackaged, put in new boxes, refrozen, put, put back on other ships, and long haul freightered back to us, and then we get it. And that's all because they can, because of the labor prices and things of that nature, um, and the lack of, um, the same level of environmental regulations and labor stuff like that in China, they can do that for, you know, it's like 20 cents cheaper a pound or something like that. You know, I, I don't know what the current numbers are. And so therefore that we decided to gut all of the, the squid processing facilities here in California. Um, so that's because we don't price carbon, right? If we price carbon with the actual, the impact of of all that shipping and all that burning of fossil fuels to move that stuff and all the energy required to move that that um, relatively cheap seafood item from one side of the Pacific to the other side of the Pacific, do some stuff to it, refreeze it, and then move it back. It wouldn't it wouldn't be worth it. But but we've as a society we've chosen not to to do that. Right? We, we've not really um, uh, internalized the cost of carbon emissions. Um, so so that'll play. We'll see that as we get into these issues as well. So seafood is really cool. Okay, question so far? Okay, yeah. When you say fishery, um, so that just mean anybody who has to fish for food? Excellent question. Okay, so fishery, fishery or fisheries um, is a generic term for anything. I, I mean, I mean there, there, are, there can be technical definitions in certain contexts, but generally speaking, the term fishery refers to anything we take from the ocean. So it, can, it usually refers to the, the, the organism itself, so the fish. But a fishery could be a fish, could also be an invertebrate, could also be algae. So, so we, we talk about the crab fishery, even though a crab's not a fish. Um, but then, uh, so that's usually what we mean, but it can also, like you're saying, could also refer to the people doing it, the business of the extraction and the shipping. So, so the term refers to the, the, the um, the removal of seafood from the ocean and, and the processing. So yeah, good question, great question. Cool, other things, other things you guys are wondering about. 
Okay, so maybe I will, um, let's see, where's the good stuff? Okay, so, so um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll just pause here. Why don't we take a quick 10 minute uh, uh, bathroom break and we'll, we'll pick it up um, in a couple minutes. Uh, Brenton, uh, just when we're paused here, just I, I grabbed uh, some stuff from my box and I got the thing from jo I got Josh's, I got Josh's stuff. Oh, cool. So I haven't, I haven't, I got it just for a class. I haven't looked through it, but I think each it looks like each one's an envelope. So we could probably just hand out, you know, an envelope to each uh, student. Cool. If there's, do you have your budding card? Historically, I did. I don't know where it is or anything, so. I, I can't call it up, so I might have to do it myself. Yeah, if there's extra ones, I might just do one because I <clears throat> I don't think I ever got the official voting card. I know there was like age brackets where I didn't have to. I don't think I have to get one until like 2028 legally or something like that. So really? Yeah. So when they came out with that, it was like if you're, you know, 16 to 20, you have to do it within the next year or two. And then if you're 20 to 25, you have to do it in right. So if, it's essentially saying like, if you're 35, 40 years old, you've been driving boats, we're not gonna require you to like go do it immediately. But I think I'm coming up. <laughs> when I was looking at it, it said, if you're, if you're over 60, you also don't need to do it. Yeah. So I'm not over 60, but it was getting, I'm getting close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might be, I think yours might be like 2030 though. Um, boarding yeah, car. the old farts. Age. Yes. What's up, dude? Uh, I was going to tell Dr. Spees. Uh, I sent you an Oh, email. hey, Brenton, here. <laughs> I, I sent you an email, Dr. Spees, um, about setting up yeah. like a meeting or something with you? I just got that out. So I'm not the academic advisor this semester. Okay. So I don't have access to your car anymore. So um, Dr. Reinemann took over. Uh, now he's back from sabbatical. So shoot Dr. Reinemann an email and schedule a meeting with him. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So Willa just said, we have an advisor. Yeah. So um, just, so, just so you guys know, so that, or... Well, remind me when people come back and I'll tell everybody. So, so, um, so we have our, our the, what they call advising. That's like generic advising. That's like, you know, every, every student advising. So that's mostly for so your language requirement, your GE requirement, like that, that type of stuff. <clears throat> and then every major has their own uh, internal advisors. And so we, ours are Dr. Reinman's your default and Dr. Patch is sort of your, your, fall back if he's like not around or something. Um, and so uh, everybody has that, but in particular our program, because we're so interdisciplinary and we have so many sort of parts, um, it really is helpful to, to chat with us. And I would say that, oh, look who's here. The great Dr. Horn. We're on, a, we're on a 10 minute break, you can come in. This is coastal marine management, my friend. No, it's all good. We're on break. Jesus, Dorothy. I was, I'm, I'm using all kinds of stuff. Dorothy, how dare you imply that I'm using only. QJS or grass. Uh, till midday. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, but you, I mean, but if you need something, if you want to okay. plop down, whatever. Okay. All right. I didn't know that. Well, I don't know how it yeah, and the and the other thing you should know is what we've started. We started doing this about. I'm gonna do that, Brenton. We started doing that about a year and a half ago or so. Um, what? Uh, so you know, I don't remember when you guys start to register for classes, like like early November or whatever it is, or mid November, or whatever. So like a couple weeks beforehand. A week or two beforehand, we've started having pizza parties. Going to be so, on the Halloween. Uh, I think it's Halloween day or that. 
Thursday. We'll have we scheduled that party. Oh, no, oh, cool. Oh, cool. Well, I thought it, I thought Sackness was in November. It's the end of October. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, so, okay, good. So, um, so I want to will remind me when everybody comes back. I'll say that. But, um, but uh, so then you're gonna miss one of the most fun ESRM events of the year, which is our annual coastal Halloween costume contest. Wow. Um, yeah, that's okay. You'll miss. It. That's fine. Um, anyway, so so we'll have our costume contest, and then right after that, we'll have because you know, we end at noon, we'll have the pizza party. Um, and so, but it's okay if you're going to be away. You guys can always talk to us. But the idea is we're, we just try to make those, and it's just essentially a pizza party. And then Dr. Patch will say, hey, next semester we're teaching oink, 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 and oink. And then, um, and then we just throw it open, and, all, and most of the faculty are here, and you guys can come talk to us. Hey, so I, I think I'm thinking about taking blah, blah, blah. What about blah, blah, blah? So it's just a way to help us help, help, us help you with the advising stuff. Um, but but again, you can meet with Dr. Reinemann or Dr. Patch anytime to talk about planning stuff. Okay, this is, I was supposed to be graduating in the spring, and I was under the impression that uh, conservation biology was going to be taught in both semesters, but someone told me yesterday that geography offered in the spring, and so now I'm freaking out because apparently the class is super full, and I don't want to go back. So, so that's a great question to talk to our advice. <laughs> That used to be my problem to solve. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, it's um, it's someone else's challenge. But um, but yeah. So can you, or do you have that time window free to take the class? I would, I would have to stop working on my class. But it just comes to well, is it a class? Is it an ESRM class that you need to, or is this another? It's an ESRM elective. I'm not sure that it's going to be elective. Offered yeah. Well, what, what's it, what elective is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So I would say so. Have you emailed Dr. Steele? About no. Email her, um, like today, okay. and just say say you're just talking to Dr. A, and he was saying that we're not probably not going to be offering cons bio in the spring. So that's not our choice. That's an issue with the budget and stuff. So we've been we we've had to change some things. So um, so in your in your roadmap, it's it said like oh both semesters, but. Yeah. Because of the budget, they make they made us change stuff. So, so anyway, so just email her and say, hey, I really, you know, I, I need to graduate in the spring, and I need this, and can I please, and and, and then I'll let her talk to you about that. But um, but yeah, do it now. Totally. 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 That'd be great. That'd be perfect. That'd be perfect. Yeah. I love it. 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 Okay. Are most people back? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Um, so I'll just I'll just kick this off. Okay, so um, so why don't we get going, you guys? So I know a couple people are still probably dribbling back in, but let's just uh, let's keep going. Um, so uh, the the a couple of things we we're just talking about when we we're paused there for break, real quick, is um, uh, just to let folks know, uh, uh, Dr. Spee's last year was uh, we, we we rotate we rotate our our advisors every year or so. Um, uh, this semester. Or maybe this whole year, but at least for right now, uh, Dr. Reinemann is our is our point person. If you want to go meet with someone and chat about what classes are coming up, or hey, did I did I get this requirement met, or whatever, um, and then if he's not available, Dr. Patch. So you can always talk to Dr. Spees and I, like sort of generally, but we don't we can't approve, we can't see your we can't see your um, car report and stuff. So so the so we're more than happy to give you some you know qualitative advice, but for the real getting stuff approved or whatever, uh, please reach out to Dr. Reinemann for that stuff. One, two, the other one that, uh, just cause it came up, haven't talked about it yet, but I'll just, I'm very excited to say that uh, uh, 
uh, you guys should all be planning now your costume for our annual, this is like our 19th year, our annual uh, coastal and marine management Halloween costume contest. So sometimes it's close to Halloween. This year it's actually on Halloween, so it's epic. So um, no pressure, no pressure. But I'm just saying, I'm looking for some kick butt uh, costumes uh, uh, in, in eight weeks or whenever the hell that is. So um, yeah, so start planning now. I'll, I'll, just, say, I'll just say that there's, uh, uh, there's two co categories. One is just the best overall costume. And the other is the best illustration of a coastal or marine management theme. So that's, that's as broad as you can possibly think of it as. Could be a critter, could be a... Uh, an activity could be whatever so you guys can start uh, when you're bored uh, this weekend not sure what to do you can think about what would be a cool costume okay all right um, so let, let, let's keep going here um, we'll we'll pick back up um, with this stuff with our intro to sort of the the, the big picture here um, and I'll just say that another key theme that we're going to see throughout the coastal uh, throughout this class is that um, diversity is really the norm so these are just a few things from my office uh, that I, I grabbed to just take a picture of um, and and just to sort of um, uh, illustrate that. Uh, so one, here's an F-bomb because I uh, apologize you guys, but I sometimes swear a lot. I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't swear a lot, but there's, there's I often drop F-bombs when I talk about coastal marine management. Um, uh, this, this is definitely something that's true in the coastal zone because it's expensive, because it's, it's, it can be trying at times and, and very diverse and things that we're not used to seeing when we move to another site and things like that. Um, uh, sometimes things look hard, sometimes things look challenging, th sometimes things look like work, but all of them are really worth engaging uh, uh, in. And uh, I think, I think uh, you know, because we live here, we sort of appreciate that, but I think it's important to say. Uh, fantastic art, all kinds of critters. Um, this piece of coral is a fantastic thing. So the largest uh, biogenic structure on the earth is the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and you can see it from space. You can see that life is so, um, so cool that it's making things that can be seen from a satellite. Um, and, and unfortunately, many of our coral reefs are under threat. Well, as I mentioned before, we'll be talking about the food provisioning and the, and the the important um, uh, protein sources and stuff we'll get from the ocean later in the semester. Um, uh, uh, and we think about that in terms of typically food, but also comes in other forms. So this uh, uh, Save Our Shore is beer. Um, one of the key things we use to help uh, make beer a smooth is out adding alginates and things like that that come from things like a giant kelp and, and, and other uh, uh, algae. Life has been manipulating the coastal zone for a long time. This is an ammonite. This is a fossil. Um, and, you know, for, for billions of years, we've had uh, life um, um, interacting with energy and material flows, all that kind of good stuff. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is a piece of glass, which essentially comes from, um, you know, melting down sand, basically, right? So melting down uh, silicon uh, oxides. Um, and uh, and then we've done a lot of we've done a lot of manipulation. So this is an ancient deer um, a jawbone or part of an ancient deer, deer jawbone, um, and we've we humans have actively uh, you know for the last several millennia have actively messed with stuff, but especially in the last few hundred years, and in particularly since um, uh, World War II and the invention of a whole new suite of technologies and abilities to rapidly transform populations and landscapes, we've really started to actively change what the coastal zone looks like. Um, and then I just like this uh, license plate I found in a bar one time, um, but it, uh, I really like because it it's sliced up. It's all these different things. And that's how I really think of our coastal zone. It's really diverse. And there's, there's a bit from over here, there's a bit from over there. There's something coming from the air. There's something coming from far away. There's something from coming nearby. And it all comes together uh, to craft um, uh, the thing that we have before us. Um, uh, I'll play. I'll play one more short video, I guess, because this one I think is is an interesting take, and I think uh, this is from a Ken Burns documentary on prohibition, and I think it's I think it's helpful to make sure we reset our framework in terms of thinking about some of these things. So this is talking about what's going on off of the East Coast. Um, so again, there was people were worried that people drank too much stuff, 
And so this prohibition movement, we passed an amendment to the Constitution to ban alcohol consumption. And this is what happened. We would say 35,000 miles. It's, it's, quite, it's quite diverse. First, the United States Coast Guard had only 55 vessels capable of patrolling more than a few miles from shore. Soon, scores of other seafarers were following McCoy's example, sometimes outfitting their boats with powerful aircraft engines so that they could easily outrun any Coast Guard ship. The trade transformed the Bahamian economy. When the United States government complained to Britain that American law was being undermined by Nassau officials, the man in charge of the British colonial office refused to intervene. Winston Churchill believed that prohibition was an affront to the whole history of mankind. <laughs> From the tip of Florida all the way north to the coast of Maine, a permanent picket line of rusting freighters, tramp steamers, and converted submarine chasers tossed at anchor just beyond the three-mile limit of U.S. jurisdiction. We'll talk about that uh, next week. This chain of floating liquor warehouses was called Rum Road. Every evening after dark, fast-moving little boats carried cargo to drop-off points on shore. When people would go to the beaches on the south shore of Long Island or on Virginia Beach and Cape Cod, you could see it. You just see these enormous boats. A person in New said it was like at night, seeing the lights of the boats, it was like seeing a city out there. They were that thick. Boom connectors. They would dump cartons of liquor that floated somehow and then came ashore and then the owners would have been notified and they would come down to the beach and wait for the liquor to come in. And it would be blocked in some way that meant it was for them. I know I had friends who lived on that shore who said if they got up early enough, they could get the liquor <laughs> and take it to their house and steal it from the man who was waiting for them. Rum Row was busiest at what was called the Rendezvous, off the southern coast of Long Island, where New Yorkers in motor launches moved from ship to ship, comparing prices before deciding what to buy. It was like going to a supermarket, one schooner captain recalled. We had a good reputation and lots of customers. They would carry your mail ashore and bring you anything you wanted. Okay, so um, so that idea of uh, it's it's hard to imagine when they he said we had fifty five Coast Guard vessels. That's for the whole U.S. So this was it was not even fair, right? I mean, it was like these guys. This is just like Miami in the nineteen eighties with cocaine running and all this kind of stuff. Now, I mean, there's the, the the folks bringing in the the contraband were so well financed they were running the show, right? And, and that was because we had not um, understood the, the, the porosity of the coastal zone, how, how we were just you know, pointing to the ocean and these folks were just <sighs> dropping in stuff, boom, taking off. So a great example of how these economies can spin up very, very quickly and, and, uh, and, uh, and lead to all kinds of funky things. Uh, other issues that are going on now that sort of tie into coastal range management. So this is an example, the South China Sea, every day there's something. Right now, the biggest, the hottest hot zone is between the Philippines and China. Essentially, the South China Sea, which is the, the ocean um, from sort of mainland China out towards Indonesia and, and, and uh, um, 
uh, the Philippines. Uh, China really, really, really thinks that that's theirs. And so um, we'll, we'll eventually talk about the law of the sea and how all this stuff works. But suffice it to say, what China's been doing is destroying coral reefs like this right here. So they've moved on in and they've taken a dredge and they've started pumping up sand onto the coral reef, smothering, killing the coral reef, but making essentially a terrestrial area. And then they put a presence there, right? So ostensibly they claim it's like fishing activity or whatever, but really it's a military um, thing. And we've seen that play out now in all kinds of dimensions. And, um, and this is essentially a land grab. This is, and, and, this, and even though it's, it's, this is not recognized internationally as Chinese territory, they're essentially de facto saying, oh no, this is our territory because we're here. And, um, and there's been, you know, flares fired and boats running into each other and all kinds of stuff that, that's going on. And so where our boundaries are is also an important thing to talk about when we talk about coastal and marine management. Now, when we get to the ocean, the marine part of coastal marine management, um, the ocean is the largest of uh, uh, biosphere on the planet, right? So the average depth of the ocean, which we'll get to when we start talking about the, the physical oceanography intro, um, is the average depth of the ocean is about four kilometers, the average depth. So a lot of the ocean is deeper than that. That's, that's a hard place, right? That's a dark place. That's far away. And so a lot of the stuff that goes on there is out of sight and out of mind. And so one of the, the classic examples of this is the fishing activity that goes on there, the so-called ghost nets, where we, we deploy a net to capture fish. And then if it breaks off, it's like, oh, well, right? And nobody can see it and we don't notice it. And so this is a legacy of that. So these are fish, mola molas and some sharks and some tunas and stuff that have been caught in this um, essentially a killing tool and not even being used, not even being used for food or whatever, and just floating. And because these things are made of plastic and are very durable, they can persist sometimes for years and years, if not decades at, at times. Um, and they're just killing indiscriminately things. So, so that's, again, if that was happening right here on campus, if that was happening in downtown LA, you know, of course we wouldn't do that. People would say, what the heck? And we cut it out, but because we aren't, we don't have that physical presence continuous presence in the ocean, it allows some of these things that, that to continue because they're out of sight, out of mind, goes fishing. Um, we we'll talk about things like uh, coral bleaching, like is going on there. This is last year uh, out at, um, me out at the Great Barrier Reef. Um, we'll also talk about the changing things. So just like we talked about the changing uh, of frequency of, dis of um, disasters, there's also some ongoing background changes that are happening. And the clearest example of this is sea level rise. So this is a this is not a re, this is a real picture, but the visualization here is a is a computer uh, thing. So we've artificially added the predicted level of seawater uh, a, a sea level rise into this part of Miami, right? And uh, now obviously you wouldn't buy this hotel or this condo or whatever if it was surrounded by water, um, and so people have invested in this, and much of this real estate people do not live in. So much of this real estate here in places like Miami is an investment vehicle for South American business folks, Russian oligarchs, things of that nature. So they're not buying it to necessarily live there every single day. They're buying it because they wanna park their money in a secure place, right? So if that happens to be your town, that's sort of a, a sweet thing. People are paying taxes and stuff, but they're not using your water and stuff. Um, but that whole equation is all based on these folks getting a return on their real estate investment, not living there. So what's very, 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 very likely to happen in the next couple decades, I don't know if it's going to happen next year or five years now, but 100%, I can, or I can't say 100%, I can say 99%, I'm sure this is how it's going to play out, is the sea level at some point is going to get to the point where um, it just starts to have this flooding, right? And at that point, the Russian oligarch that owns this, owns this apartment is going to suddenly decide, oh my God, there's water around here. Screw this. And they're going to sell their apartment or their condo or their whatever it is, real estate investment, and go invest in London or go invest in Caracas or wherever the heck the other place is, right? So they don't care. Their money will move. But over, and then once that guy sells, the next person is going to go, oh man, maybe I should sell. And it'll very likely lead to this cascade of real estate selling off 
And if your building is surrounded by water, shocker, people probably aren't gonna wanna buy it, right? So the whole, this whole economy of, of this part of, of Florida, of Miami, is based on ta the tax basis. So if all of a sudden everybody leaves and nobody's paying into taxes, suddenly there's gonna be this massive cratering of resources for the public agencies and, and the government. And that's gonna be hugely problematic. And we do not have a response for that. Um, so that's not how it's gonna play out in Oxnard or, or Ventura or whatever, but in these really, really low lying areas, it's a high likelihood that that's what's gonna happen. And so when we talk about these coastal and marine management themes, sometimes you hear stuff people ignorantly say, oh, that's about the elites, or that's about the people who live on the coast. This has ramifications for all of us, right? So if Miami goes subtitle, that's gonna impact our, our nation and, 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 and region, right? So, so we need to grapple with these things as adults. This isn't a, a put that off to the end. Um, Venice is dealing with it. This is uh, flooding in Venice. They're actually adding giant valves like this to the, to the lagoons um, that, that affront Venice. Uh, and then we have a bunch of just silly things. So, so this is some funny cartoon stuff about how people have taken maybe not the best approach to coastal marine management. In this case, this is uh, then President Trump when he when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico and he went down and threw a bunch of paper towels at people to, for a photo op. Um, and um, you know, I'm not trying to get political here, but I'll just say that there wasn't maybe effective resources brought to bear to help people with that. Another unfortunate example was the then, um, and this was a, a couple years before, but this was the then governor of New Jersey, who, um, because of a budget crisis, shut many of the beaches in New Jersey are state beaches. And because they had a budget cut, they shut down the beaches, no lifeguards and everything. So they said the public could not go to the beaches, except he wanted to go to the beach. So he took his family to the beach. So when the whole population of New Jersey couldn't go to the beach, he and his family went to the beach and a bunch of, uh, of reporters went and took photos of him. And so, um, so that's also maybe not a great thing, right? If we all can't use these resources, it's probably not a smart thing for you to go use it for your own private, uh, private thing. Um, we have a history of exclusion and, and disenfranchisement, especially in places like Southern California. And so we'll talk, we'll be talking more about this, but this is uh, Bruce's Beach. This is this area in Manhattan Beach that that um, is, a, is a poster child for stuff we'll talk about um, uh, shortly. Um, but essentially this was at the time considered like not a very desirous area. And this African-American family bought some land and then got their friends to buy some land. They said, hey, maybe we can do um, a sort of uh, 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 a community here and a, and a re recreational place. And that went on for a little bit until the um, uh, existing power structures decided, oh no, we want that. And so they used eminent domain to take their property. And again, we'll get into this story, but but um, it, it's it's a still unfolding story, but it's it's a it's a key marker of the thing we'll talk about next. Um, and the same thing goes on uh, all over the place. This is in another similar example in Australia, where where traditional folks uh, uh, managed to make a living in this area that originally was considered sort of junk land or not really desirous land. And then when the powers of be decide, oh no, this is great prime oceanfront property, those folks are displaced. Uh, we need a lot of objectivity to, to deal with the stuff we're going to talk about in this class. Um, all kinds of things we can skip around. There's still also, though, uh, I really want to make sure I say this before we get into the next subject. It's awesome. The coast and the ocean is awesome. It's such a just effing cool place. So this, so what does this look like when you guys look up at the screen? What, 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 is it, what does this appear to be? Like a sea cave. Yeah, totally, right? Yeah, I agree. This is not a sea cave. This is all underwater. So this is, we're looking through water. So this is this crazy brine pool. So this looks like air, this is water. And this stuff that looks like denser, it looks like little waves, there are little waves, but the waves are between this chunk of water and this chunk of water down here. So this is an undersea brine lake. Um, uh, crazy cool stuff, crazy cool stuff. I mean, these, are, these are amazing parts of our planet. Check out this thing. This is not a prop. This is, I mean, this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a prop, but it, it's, it's cast off of a real crocodile, right? These, some of these crocodiles, saltwater crocodiles can be 12, 15, 18 feet long. I mean, they are crazy. Um, we still have amazingly cool critters like turtles and things like that. Turtles are getting, you know, whacked and they're, and they're not the numbers they used to be and stuff, but, but so what, there's still amazing wonder 
um, in our oceans and in our coastal zone. Um, and awesomeness still exists. So this is, uh, I might disappear for a little bit to, uh, and, and Dr. Spees will give some lectures um, for some of our work in Turkey, but um, you know, all kinds of crazy cool wildlife at the coast. Um, and this is us uh, uh, anesthetizing what we would call a grizzly bear, they call a brown bear. Um, and, uh, and there's still awesomeness. Um, and there's still, uh, and, it's, and, and that awesomeness is tied back to the management. So our culture influences the ecosystems and these ecosystems influence the culture. And so this is, uh, uh, this is my grandma on a beach in Hawaii. This is um, a, a hula dancer and, and the hula dancing and, and the cultural interpretation from the coast is, is all intertwined. And now we use hula to communicate ways to manage the coast to different uh, groups of school kids and stuff. Um, and so then I'll just say that I'm coastal. So I wanna, we're gonna turn to an, I know this is, you guys have been sitting around for way too long. This is much too passive an intro lecture for you guys. Um, but um, I'll just say that I'm coastal. So we heard a little bit about, about Professor Spees. I'm coastal. This is back when I had more hair in graduate school, but I still always did dumbass things. So this is me uh, running on the, I had run where you're not supposed to run down at the dock. I was, my project was doing diving. Um, and I put my hand through my mask and cut open my hand. So I've been doing dumb things at the coast for a long, long, long time. Uh, so this is a little bit of me. So I grew up in uh, right looking over the ocean. So I was born in a hospital in a place called Daly City, just uh, like up in San Francisco, that the hospital overlooks the ocean. And this is this is uh, my uh, family's first house. And this window looked out at the ocean um, in essentially affordable housing. My parents bought that house for twenty six thousand dollars in the very, very late 60s. Right. So this was, this was a lot of money back then, but this wasn't a hundred times my, you know, my, my income. So things have changed. So back then the people lived in, the, the, in our neighborhood were all working class and folks that didn't have a lot of money that has, had, that has changed, right? Um, this is my family in a lava tube in Hawaii a few years ago. This is my dad. My dad's an artist, and this is a sketch of him that Tony Bennett did of him um, when they were talking about San Francisco. They were sitting in a, in a, in a place overlooking um, uh, this famous view. Um, my my uh, parents worked at the coast when they were when they were kids. So my my cultural ancestry is people that work. This is a place called Playland at the Beach. We'll see that a, a little bit more later. But this is a, an entertainment complex, in this case, by Ocean Beach in the city of San Francisco. We had similar things in Santa Monica, similar things in San Diego, similar things in Santa Cruz, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, and this is my family again at the beach. This is us uh, checking out elephant seals. Um, this is my dad was in the Navy. My family has a, a history of, of naval service. This is my dad's Navy card. Um, my son is, is, is finishing, uh, he's a senior like several of you are, uh, uh, and is studying things in the ocean. This is my mom and my aunt in um, uh, the neighborhood they grew up in, which is um, which was a, a then an African American neighborhood in, um, in in a neighborhood in San Francisco that also was very closely tied to the ocean. And I can go on and on and on. So I was born at the coast. I um, I I one time had an offer. I don't know if Brenton even knows this. I had an offer. I had a job offer one time to be a professor of restoration ecology in a different state. If you want to guess anybody, and I, and I and I I was kind of thinking about it, and then a colleague from that university said, hey, "Sean, you don't want to come here. You won't be happy here." And if you want to guess what state that was? Ooh, good guess, good guess. No, but yes, but that's an excellent guess. It's what? Oh, Louisiana, close to Louisiana, but not Louisiana. Uh, far the no, uh, not Florida. Uh, other way. Texas. So College Station, Texas. Oh, and they boy. said, dude, <laughs> dude, uh, I, I don't think you would oh. like it here. <laughs> and so I, I took that to heart. And so then I, I stayed at my then university. And then um, and then a little bit later, this job opened up. Uh, so anyway, um, but 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 uh, some of my work in Turkey is in some wetlands sort of far from the ocean. Um, but that's really the only thing I do that's not at, you know, right at the coast or in the ocean. So both my, my family's life, um, my, my history, 
um, uh, my professional stuff, the stuff I do with you guys, I really love the coast. And I love other, I love other parts of our planet, but I feel personally feel most at home when I'm near the water. I mean, we don't live at the water. We don't, we don't have a beachfront home or anything, but, but I find personally, I love going to the Sierras. I love going to the des desert Southwest. Awesome place. Love it. But I, I personally, just me, I love to visit. I couldn't live in those places. And so I really appreciate my friend that said, yeah, dude, don't come to College Station, Texas, because I don't think you'll be happy. Um, and, and it's true. So, so um, I really love the coast and I'm really stoked that you guys are, are involved with this stuff. Okay, so you heard about Dr. Spees, you heard about me. Now I want you guys to introduce yourselves to each other. So uh, take a minute and uh, groups of two or three, just sort of spin to each other. And we'll just take about five minutes, but I just want you guys to introduce yourselves to your bud um, and talk about something you did this summer at or near the coast. And then, uh, and then you know, maybe some of your thoughts about getting the, all these things we're just starting to talk about. So we'll, that'll be the first thing. It'll we'll take about five minutes. I'll start my timer and you guys just uh, 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 start chat. And I'm gonna pause our recording here. All right, Brent, I'm gonna, I'll be right back. I just gotta go hit something real quick. That's good.
Okay. If everybody's had a chance to introduce themselves, so the next thing I want you guys just for a couple of minutes here is, is uh, you might have already started talking about this, but I want you guys to share with each other uh, something you're most excited about uh, for this class and some of the things you're most like worried about or anxious about this class. So another quick uh, five minutes, ready, set, go.